Hey, it's Michelle. I'm Brandy. And this is Spooky Shit. Do you think that we were both talking at the same time? At the- <laughs> I think I laughed and then you started. Let's keep it. Whatever. <laughs> we'll keep this in too. So this week we're talking about murder for hire. I'm going to be starting off talking about Natalie Bollinger. And then I'm going to talk about Susan Kuhnhausen. Quite a name. I always choose the people with... <laughs> you do. I'm surprised you didn't choose like, a random Russian person. <laughs> Warning, this episode may contain graphic details. Listener discretion is advised. All right. So I actually found out about this case while I was researching Riverdale Road and our More Urban Legends and a Woman Who Knew Many Things episode. The longest title in that. And that's why I suggested this topic to you, Brandy. Mm -hmm. Whenever we talked about it for like a second, I was like, I know what I want to do. I see what you did there. (laughs) Yep. So, Natalie Bollinger was only 19 years old when she was reported missing from her family home in Broomfield, Colorado, on December 28, 2017. She was described by her dad as being a good girl, passionate artist, and she loved nature and animals. He said she had gotten a full scholarship to the University of Colorado Boulder and was supposed to start school that semester. Her disappearance was especially worrying because a few weeks beforehand, on December 13, she posted on Facebook about how she had a stalker named Sean Schwartz. I'm going to read you her post. Her Facebook is still up. Everyone. Ooh. Dude, this is like the one of the longest times I've spent on a story because I was just going through everyone's Facebooks. That's funny. Hey, y'all. I have a public announcement. There is a man, Sean Shorts. I met this man when I was young. I ran into him about two years ago. Long story short, I became friends with him. I helped him out with rides and stuff. I moved to Virginia. He moved across country to see me. Slept behind my work for weeks. When I told him I didn't want to see him anymore, he sent me hundreds of texts and calls. He parked his car in front of my house, blocking military highway for hours, laying on his horn. He was arrested. Since then, I've asked him to leave me alone, and he won't. He sent emails for over a year close to every day harassing me, making numerous accounts until I block him again, threatening my family, telling me he'll kill himself in front of me, and sending my friends and family harassing messages as well. I'm sharing this because he's posting slander about me all over Facebook. So if you receive a message, I'm sincerely sorry. Please ignore him. It only encourages him when he gets a response, much like a child. He's mentally ill, and I'm trying to fix this. Along with his post, there's a screenshot of a Facebook account named Michelle Brannick with a post like underne- underneath it saying, I made this account so I could get rid of my real Facebook permanently. It didn't work. I hate Facebook. And a thumbnail from a Facebook Live showing an older man with a long beard. This account belonged to 42-year-old Sean Schwartz. A few days later, on December 16th, Natalie commented on her original post and said that Sean had been served with a restraining order and they were going to court, with him facing charges of stalking and harassment. So, of course, Sean was immediately deemed suspicious when she went missing. Sean took to Facebook Live to address Natalie's disappearance and say he had nothing to do with it. He said the police had reached out to him, but didn't tell him if he was a suspect or not in the case. He pleaded in the video for help finding Natalie and posted a picture of her saying she was missing. The day after going missing, a body was found in a wooded area near Riverdale Road on land belonging to McIntosh Dairy in Thornton, Colorado, which Riverdale Road is literally the road I talked about. Mm -hmm. Like, that I don't know. That just creeped me out. (laughs) Within a few days, it was publicly confirmed that this body was indeed that of Natalie Bollinger. She had died from a single gunshot wound to the head and also had a potentially lethal amount of heroin in her blood at the time of her death. That last part wasn't too too shocking i mean the lethal amount was but natalie did have a history of heroin and meth use and she had needle tracks on her arm and hand no gun was found at the murder scene it's actually pretty crazy because natalie's post about having a stalker is still up like i was able to go and read her original comment at like back in 2017 because it has 2.6 thousand comments so Facebook kept like freezing as I was scrolling up and I was like, just let me get to it. Just let me get to it. Yeah. As soon as she went missing though, and especially when it was found she was murdered, comments started pouring in accusing Sean of hurting her. I read a couple of articles referring to him as a person of interest at this time, but others were saying he wasn't considered a suspect. So I'm not sure what exactly was like legally happening with Sean. 
I went back through Sean's Facebook, and in January of 2017, he posted two pictures, one of an x-ray and one of a leg, both saying Natalie's leg after her suicide attempt in 2016. He also posted a drawing he did of her the same day, and the same drawing again two months later. And this was before she died. Like, almost a year before she died. On January 7th of 2017... Sean Schwartz was arrested, but not for what you would think. Apparently, he'd been posting suicidal posts on Facebook, including one on January 5th asking the police to come find him and, quote, put me in the ground. When meeting police, he told them he missed his friend Natalie and that he didn't want to live on the planet anymore, before agreeing to be taken to Boulder Community Health to be placed on a mental health hold. While police were attempting to complete paperwork to admit Sean, he began to yell after security took his cell phone and wouldn't let the staff help him. He was then arrested for obstruction, which, like, side note, how the fuck are you going to arrest somebody who's having a mental break because they're, like, showing signs of having a mental break? Okay. Doesn't really make sense. Also, it sounds like you're very far from the mic whenever you said that. <laughs> Just so you know. Uh -oh. My bad. <laughs> when police tried to put cuffs on Sean, he began to yell and push the arresting officers away. He dragged some of the officers to the ground as well. When police tried to take him to their car, he refused to walk and yelled at the officers before they placed a spit hood on him. I looked this up and it's literally like a mesh hood that prevents detainees from spitting or biting. And they look like pretty fucked up. Like they don't look like something that should be used today. It looks like medieval. And I had no idea that they existed. I also read on one website that he kicked one of the officers, but two different sites said different things. One of them mentioned him dragging him to the ground. The other ones mentioned him kicking them. So... Sean was also charged with second-degree assault on a peace officer, which is a felony, and, a res and resisting arrest along with the obstruction charge. I'm assuming he was released on bail or something because by January 18th, 2018, he was back to posting on Facebook, this time screenshots of messages he had with Natalie back in the middle of 2016. They seemed to be pretty friendly, but with a couple of, like, weirder parts, like him saying if he was 20 years younger, he'd come and make her his, but most of it did just seem friendly yeah there stuff like that i was like uh, no so no. yeah no it's so at the time she was 18 and he was like 41 super creepy oh wow <laughs> also back in 2016 natalie has sent him a long email describing her life growing up switching between living with her mom and her dad in a foster home with her twin sister alicia she said how her dad would abuse her mom and then his stepmom, and by the age of 14, he was having her sell drugs along with her sister for him. She also wrote that she was supposed to be held in a group home until she was 21 because she wouldn't stop getting high. I should mention all of these messages that I saw, they're just screenshots he posted on his Facebook in the wrong order, and he could definitely be cutting stuff out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but it appeared that he was also, like, maybe friends with her twin sister alicia and maybe some of their friends too because there were so many mentions of like other friends names but i could not figure out who they were in relation to anything on january 20th sean posted messages from december 15th just two days after she posted on facebook about him stalking her it began with natalie saying who it was and saying she didn't want to call him only text and they needed to meet at starbucks when he was free his response started with natalie i'm scared of you i don't know the right thing to do and i don't want you to feel unsafe he then explains he feels uncomfortable in Boulder and mentions that he'd been assaulted there. She says she wants to talk so they can stop fighting and stop all the crazy. They planned on a meeting time and presumably met up, but I'm not sure what happened during this, but it was the day she said she got a restraining order, so it's possibly she was just, like, serving him with a restraining order or someone else was there. So, I have absolutely no idea what happened between the middle of 2016 and December of 2017, but clearly some shit went down, just because... Like, her getting a restraining order, and they went from, like, being friendly to now she's like, dude, leave me alone. And even her text saying, like, she doesn't want them to be, like, fighting and stuff, and everything's been crazy. And also, just side note, that even though they were friendly before, that doesn't mean he wasn't stalking her. Because yeah. there were, yeah, there were times I was reading it, and I was like, oh, it seems like they were just friends. Like, I'm confused. And I was like, oh, these messages were from, like, a year before, and she could just be trying to, like, placate this older dude who's talking to her. I was looking through a lot of Sean's pictures on his Facebook. He has over 2,000, by the way, and I scrolled all the way to the bottom. Facebook also kept freezing for that. 
And it seemed like he had some pretty intense mental health issues going on and at times was like on and off homeless. So he may not have been in the best state of mind at the time. Not that that's an excuse to stalk somebody. I just wanted to add that in too. <laughs> the next message from Sean to Natalie was on December 28th, the day she went missing. He basically is just saying he's scared for her and she needs to call her mom or the police. And that if she needs help, she can just ask him. The next day, he texts her again saying he has some money and can help her if she needs it. He also starts the message with, Natalie, because of the restraining order, I'm committing felonies to make sure you are safe. Can't figure out if that's nice or creepy. Probably creepy. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> on february 8th something unexpected happens a 22 year old named joseph michael lopez is arrested and charged with murdering natalie so to me and i'm sure tons of other people at the time who thought sean did it this came as like a fucking shock just reading about how she had a stalker and all this stuff he would frequently post about her i was like oh, okay yeah he totally did it and then this dude joseph kind of came out of left field <laughs> he said surprise bitch Surprise, bitch, it's me. Murder. <laughs> Joseph was an engaged manager at a Domino's Pizza and was described by a coworker and former friend as having a big heart and being funny, and she mentions him having a child, but I didn't see that anywhere else. She said she was in denial when she first saw he was arrested because she'd even spoken to him about Natalie Bollinger's case, and he pretended to be shocked by everything that was going on. How creepy is that? Um, super creepy. She also said the day after Natalie's body was found, Joseph was throwing up and had to have his shift covered. I don't know if that's guilt or more fear he was going to get in trouble, though, you know? Maybe it was both. Maybe a little bit of both. So, Joseph was originally connected to Natalie's disappearance and murder when police were looking through her phone and saw more than 100 text messages between the two the night she was reported as missing. When detectives went to go see him at his job, he said that he was pretty sure that he knew why they were there and... He was sure it had something to do with the girl he talked to on Craigslist. Initially, he denied being involved in Natalie's murder, but when he finally began to tell the truth, his story was fucking crazy. So, I didn't... This I especially did not see. I want to give you guys some background here. Whenever I heard about the story, I was reading about Riverdale Road and someone was just, like, talking about having creepy experiences and they just casually mentioned, like, oh, my friend said that she knew a girl who, like, had been murdered over there. And I was like, what happened? And it took... It's a wild ride, honestly. <laughs> okay, I'm ready. I know. So, according to Joseph, he was on the Women Seeking Men section on Craigslist when he saw an ad with a weird title. It said, I want to put a hit on myself. So, the ad is gone now, but according to his story, it was posted by Natalie and she was requesting that somebody kill her. Joseph himself had struggled with depression and made suicide attempts, so he came up with a fake persona of a hitman that he used to answer her ad and tell her he was willing to help her commit suicide. He told police that he has an app on his phone that basically lets him, like, create personas, and one of his 12 personas has a charismatic backstory that can lure people in, but then he turns psycho and he strikes. He and Natalie were emailing by 3 a.m. on December 28th and then later in the morning texting. They exchanged around 111 texts in three hours. In the text, he agreed to meet her and assist her in suicide by killing her. This is just... A lot. Just within hours. Uh, I just don't get it. She told Joseph that she wanted to be shot because she wanted it to happen quickly. Joseph said she, quote, wanted to get on her knees and be executed from behind because she didn't want to see the gun. It's dark. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Natalie supposedly asked how much it would cost to hire him, and he answered, from hundreds to thousands, it just depends. She asked if he had a gun, and she said no, so she offered to bring one herself that he could keep or sell if he wanted. Presumably as a form of payment. And one of his first statements, he said he went around noon on December 28th and got to Natalie's apartment to pick her up. They continued to talk about how her death would carry out. So he was just fucking down, I guess. He later told police that he was only going to talk to her about it until he gained her trust. Then he was going to try and convince her that it was a bad idea and that they shouldn't do this. She's, it's like, oh, that's why you were texting her all night? Okay, cool. According to the statement, Natalie told Joseph that she needed to get away from her boyfriend because he was bad for her, but she also seemed upset and told him that she loved her boyfriend and didn't want to leave or hurt him. Her boyfriend was actually the first person to report her missing and said that his Glock 9, I'm not good at guns, I paused so weird, his Glock got, blah, 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 his Glock 9mm pistol, his gun, mm -hmm. his gun had also vanished from his home. 
<laughs> Even as I was typing it, I was like, I'm not a gum person. I'm not going to be able to say this. Because I always want to be like 9mm. <laughs> Natalie and Joseph drove around to a couple of spots, but she didn't like any of them. So he ended up driving her home and dropped her off. He claimed this was the last time he had contacted her. Remember, this was his first statement. <laughs> Of course, his story changes again once police share that his cell phone data shows he was at the crime scene. He then says at one point, Natalie got out of his car, pulled the gun from her purse, and held it to her temple. Joseph said he tried to talk her out of it, but before he grabbed the gun, she shot herself, causing her to fall backwards against a tree. He then says he panicked and took her, per took her purse and gun before fleeing. Police let him know that they knew the gun was somewhere between one and three feet away from Natalie during the shooting, so she was 100% killed by someone other than herself. Suddenly, he changed his story again, this time saying she'd convinced him to help her kill herself. He said they parked the car, walked over to the trees, knelt down, and said a prayer together before he held the gun to her head with both of his hands, closed his eyes, and shot her. Again, though, he did say he panicked and grabbed her purse, which he hid in the trunk with his gun, before heading home. Interestingly, Joseph said at no point in time did him and Natalie take any drugs, so not totally sure when this, like, deadly dose of heroin got in her system. During the investigation, when speaking to family and friends, some did indicate that Natalie had a history of suicidal thoughts, but others said she was happy and looking forward to school in the future. Honestly, like, I feel like in a lot of cases of people committing suicide, not everyone's going to notice that they're struggling, because... Yeah. Otherwise, people probably wouldn't commit suicide if everyone always noticed. <laughs> Joseph was ultimately charged with first-degree murder, as even if Natalie did ask him to take her life, if he pulled the trigger, that death is now on his hands and his responsibility. A lot of people pointed out that rather than responding like a person to her had and trying to get help, he responded as a predator and basically jumped on the opportunity to kill her. I'll admit, whenever I was first reading it, I was like, okay, like, it's obviously fucked up, but... She wanted to kill herself, and he assisted. Like, I didn't think, I guess I didn't think it'd be first-degree murder. But after reading that, I was like, oh, yeah, if someone asks you to kill them, you usually say, like, no. <laughs> and, and try to, like, take them to a mental health hospital or something. <laughs> Sorry, my phone just beeped my ring alarm. It's just it's been annoying lately. Joseph took a plea deal for first-degree murder to eliminate the possibility of a life sentence and was sentenced to 48 years in prison. Um, side story. Around June of 2019, Sean had been posting several YouTube videos about Natalie's twin with names like Alicia Bollinger, the pretty junkie, Alicia Bollinger, the lying drug-dealing junkie who killed Natalie, and Alicia Bollinger has no conscious. conscience. <laughs> Wrong word there. I watched just like a minute of one of these, and in it he says, Alicia Bullinger, I will not stop until you are in prison. And I have like no idea what exactly happened, but from what I could gather, he thought that Alicia and the girl's dad had gotten Natalie into drugs, and Alicia had lied in something, lied about something that got Sean assaulted, because I did mention he got assaulted. It was really hard to discern what exactly happened, though, because he was like, he has so, 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 so many videos, like too many to watch. I told you he has 2,000 Facebook posts. Just looking at his YouTube, he's made videos, like, probably over 20 in the past month. <laughs> Damn. I was having to search these videos specifically by the names just based on a screenshot I saw because I couldn't even scroll down that far. <laughs> on October 19, 2019, 21-year-old Alicia was reported missing. She had last been seen at a motel in Wichita, Kansas. When she went, went missing, Sean did make more videos, though, with titles asking for help finding her. And on one of the videos, someone's comment basically says, like, shut the fuck up. We all know you had something to do with this. Turns out he did not because Alicia was found safely just a few days later. She posted on Facebook on October 21st that she had been in a really bad situation and someone had pulled a rescue mission to save her. Just really vague and stuff. <laughs> Some of the comments on her post were, of course, from Sean. Her Facebook's public, probably shouldn't be. I mean, I guess I wouldn't have seen this comment if it wasn't, but yeah, Sean puts on a lot of her shits. He said that when missing, she'd actually been with her dad, Ted Bollinger, and they were on a high-speed chase over state lines when Ted was arrested and Alicia was let go. He said she was let go because she was pretty, but whatever. Uh -huh. 
So I looked more into this, and on October 20th, there is an article talking about a high-speed chase that ended in Kansas when a Ted Bullinger was arrested and an unnamed passenger was taken to a hospital. This is... It's either, like, the weirdest fucking coincidence, or it actually was Alicia and her dad involved in this. I wish I knew the dynamic happening here, Brandy. I feel I can't. Like that's too big of a coincidence if it is. Right? Especially for him to comment that, and... Because I didn't, I couldn't see like what the pictures look of this person was arrested and stuff. So it did mention like, or Sean's comment, which might at least be partly true that they had like drugs and stuff. And he makes a lot of comments about how the entire family should be in prison and how they ruined Natalie and lots of stuff. I don't know like what happened. I probably could hear Sean's story, but he has so many videos and it's too much. I spent like two hours just looking at his Facebook pictures and it's a lot. (laughs) (laughs) Alicia's made a few posts since then about losing her other half and the pain she has gone through with her twin dying. But yeah, that is basically it for my story. It was, like I said, like really hard to figure out what happened between Sean, Natalie, and Alicia because I think at one point they were all friends. And... I feel like that part is actually weirdly more confusing and perplexing than the murder itself. <laughs> A little bit, because I... No, besides... I know. I spent more time reading about Sean and his posts than I did about the man who <laughs> supposedly, like, <laughs> murdered her per her request. <laughs> True. There's just a lot going on. But yeah, I thought it was a crazy story, so I was excited to share that. <laughs> Mine's pretty crazy, too. Okay, I'm ready. You know I always bust these crazy-ass stories. I know you do. All right. So, yeah, I'm going to talk about Susan Kuhnhausen. I think I pronounced it differently. Pronounced it it. Pronounced it it it. I don't remember, so it's okay. (laughs) I'm just going to call her by what she goes by now, Susan Walters. Okay, yeah. When That's it happened, she was Kuhhausen. Okay, I'm Kuhhausen. already more intrigued because I thought you were going to be like, she died. So this is interesting oh, already. Oh, damn, I already, I already spoiled it. I get cut out me saying that, so at least the listeners will be surprised. No, it's okay. Um, <laughs> I just wanted to start off by saying Susan is a goddamn badass. Okay, okay, yeah. No, she would definitely survive then if yeah. you're saying that. You're like, a badass who unfortunately passed away. <laughs> <laughs> no no she survived she's it's badass so okay so i wanted to start by reading you the transcript to the 911 call made by ann warnock who was susan's neighbor okay all right so this is ann we have an intruder in the house next door the intruder was in the bedroom with the hammer the oh. woman who lives there thinks she may have strangled him oh <gasps> he was down when she left Dispatcher, can you put her on the phone? She's bleeding. Does she need an ambulance? No, she's a nurse. She says call an ambulance for the guy. He may be dead. (laughs) What did she use on him? She strangled him? What else did she do? She put a chokehold on him. (gasps) I've got help on the way. Stay on the line. She has a hammer here. Don't touch it. Don't touch it. Just leave it there. She hit him in the head several times. That's the hammer he had with him. She struck him and she strangled him and she thinks he's dead. Was (gasps) he by himself? Did he have anybody with him? No, she expressed a concern it may have been her ex-partner who set the person. (gasps) Have there been problems with her ex-husband or her ex-partner? She did talk to Mike, her ex-partner, and asked him to house it for the cats, and he said he couldn't do it. He was on his way to the beach. He left her a note. He knows the alarm. Okay, that's good information to pass on to the officers. That's the end. Okay, first thoughts. Is Susan the murderer here? I'm so (laughs) confused. (laughs) Oh my gosh. We'll get there. So yeah, that yeah. happened on I, September 6th. I'm so overwhelmed. <laughs> it, okay. it gets, it, yeah. So that happened on September 6th, 2006. 
Oh, that's not as long as ago as I thought it was going to be. It's like more than 10 years. I don't know. I was getting 90s vibes from this random woman strangling. So. Oh. But yeah, that's kind of like a little teaser of what my story's going to be about. Yeah, I'm really fucking interested now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but now I'm just going to backtrack a little. So Susan's early life was a little chaotic. Her parents divorced when she was in, sec- in the second grade. And as a kid, she moved a lot, like, from different, like, state to state, oh, from shit. Colorado to Arizona to California and Nevada. She was basically... All within the little West Coast area. <laughs> yeah. She was basically shuffled between schools and homes and parents, basically, just back and forth all the time. Not a fun life. No. Definitely not. I, I kind of know oh. that. Oh, spoiler. <laughs> No, I mean, like, personally. I moved oh, I thought lot. you meant you know she had a hard life. You moved a lot? Yeah. I just, never told you, just, you. I thought you said you just moved around San Diego. Yeah, but that's still a lot. I was like, oh, that's still moving. <laughs> like, I would still move to so many different counties. Or, like, oh, cities. like schools and stuff? Yeah. Oh, shit. I didn't think about the school part. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I literally, like, have been to... St- like, I went to some schools where I had to wear a uniform, and then other schools where I didn't. Like, I literally went really? everywhere. Yeah. How many times did you, like, move, or how often? Honestly, this place that I'm currently living in, that my mom's living in, actually, mm-hmm. this is the longest we've ever stayed somewhere. And how long? We've, we've been here for four, almost five years. Oh, that's not very long at all. Yeah, I kind of backtracked, and I was like, dude, we haven't lived anywhere for, like, for more than three years. Whoa! Why? She just likes moving. Maybe like work. Was... <laughs> Not even that. She's been working at the same place for like ten years. I was just gonna say, but isn't she like in the healthcare field? Yeah. <laughs> you don't have to move for that. <laughs> no, I just. I think it was just a lot. Like, well, she's a single mom, so. Oh yeah. Just kind of like wherever she could afford. Stuff yeah, like that's that. fair. And then. I didn't know that. Yeah. I've been to, like, ten schools. Holy shit, Brandy. I thought I told you this. No, that's insane. <laughs> yeah, I've literally lived in, like, so many different cities in, in San Diego and North County. I think you, like, briefly mentioned you've lived in a lot of places in San Diego, but my mind didn't really connect what that meant, you know? No, like, <laughs> I've literally... I was, like, so cultured. <laughs> I've... Esco has always been like my hometown, like Escondido I, for es- non-local listeners, oh, right? <laughs> Escondido, and then I actually moved and lived in Mexico for a little while. You lived in Mexico? Yeah, I did. I mean, it was only for like a few months while my mom basically tried to like save enough money to get a like nice place. Uh huh. And then we moved to San Marcos, and then we kind of just hopped between San Marcos and. Escondido, and then my mom got married, and we moved to like El Cajon, La Mesa, to Chula Vista. Oh my and then, god! Yeah, and then back to Escondido, but like a different part of Escondido. Yeah. <laughs> and then, and then to San Marcos, and then now I'm back in Escondido. So it's oh, been mostly shit. North County, but I have yeah. like lived elsewhere. Where did you live in Mexico? Like Tijuana? No, I lived in Ensenada, where my Isn't... mom is from. That's a little farther, though, no? Like an hour and a half or something? Yeah, it's like two hours total, I believe, to get from like here all the way down. Dang. Was she still working in San Diego at the time? I think she she was working like three jobs. That was... Oh. Yeah, my... They struggled. Um, that sounds was... fucking rough. <laughs> no, yeah, it was... Because they were trying to, like, bring my grandma over here. Mm -hmm. And me and my brother obviously were born, so we had, like, papers and they could cross us and stuff. And Yeah. um, My mom was basically working, like, three jobs, and so was my aunt. And they were, like, living out of the car for a while, just trying to save money for an apartment. Oh, shit. And then they also took my other aunt, and she was, like, going to high school and stuff. And So basically having a parent, their sister? Yeah. Dang, that is rough. And then slowly but surely, they like brought my grandma and they brought us, and we had like <laughs> a bunch of us lived in a little like three bedroom condo. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 
It's like a sleepover for all the kids <laughs> that no one that they probably didn't want to be at. Well, I mean, the only kids were me and my brother. Oh yeah, the 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 aunt was just in high school. That's not really a child. <laughs> no, yeah, it was my two aunts, one of my uncles, my grandma, my mom, and then us. Damn, Brandy, that's a full house. Yeah, it was. Oh my gosh! Actually, Often... I think there was another uncle too, but I don't know. He would just kind of come all the time and stay for like a month at a time. Oh, he, was, he was just kind of like go to different people's houses but... just hanging out just vibing yeah <laughs> but yeah I've, I've been you get susan <laughs> I get you guys susan. you guys are like two sides of the same coin <laughs> oh all right that was almost to susan. more shocking than susan's story no she strangled somebody i need nah, to this, i need this to hear story, that <laughs> this story is wild okay So, Susan became a licensed practical nurse and then a registered nurse. She eventually settled down in Portland, Oregon in the early 1980s. They described Susan as outgoing, vivacious, and a very, and she had a very boisterous laugh. I love all these adjectives. I know. I was like, I don't even know how to pronounce these. I was going to repeat them and I was like, that sounds hard. I'll just say I like them. So, in 1988, one of Susan's friends and her mother paid for a personal ad for Susan in the William Met Week, which was a paper in Oregon. Okay. But, you know, back in the day, the OG Tinder. (laughs) Oh, no. That is so embarrassing that her parents, or her parent and her sister, you said? Yeah, but it sounds like she, like, agreed to it. Oh, okay. She's like, all right. (laughs) Yeah, but I, I, they actually, I actually found like the, a screenshot of the actual like ad. So oh shit! I'll, I'll read it to you. Yes. So it was titled "Someone Different." It starts off S W F, which translates to or abbreviation for single white female. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Thirty three, overweight but not over life. Seats S M single man who wants more out of a relationship than just slender active healthcare professional enjoys exploring nw i'm not sure what that means yeah i was gonna be like "Hmm?" i'm guessing it's like an area in oregon maybe like Uh, northwest something like that interested in conversation good times (laughs) with someone who is intelligent thoughtful and full of humor must be emotionally and financially mature oh no broke well, bitches around here yeah i paused because i they used a different word oh okay but it like sounds like physically oh fiscally fiscally that's how you say it but i was no, like I i'm just know. gonna say financially yeah no same thing <laughs> if you are seeking a bright funny lady who is adventurous enough to advertise then please reply so that was like the end of the little ad i that was just so weird so weird that people used to do that right and i was like looking at the screenshot and i could see like a bunch more and i was like what the fuck oh my god and the fact that she's like interest talking to someone hanging out with people and i was like girl this sounds dry as fuck well, you had you had to like abbreviate and stuff for it to to True. fit. True, you can't really fit much in there. <laughs> yeah, and I mean that's when they would just like put their PO box at the bottom, so that's like people so weird. can mail their replies. Yeah, that's crazy. Oh my gosh. <laughs> so one of the many replies read, "Hi, different. My name is Mike. I'm a thirty thirty nine year old D W M, which is a divorced wife now." <laughs> what do all these things mean (laughs) that just kind of sums it up you know he's divorced but he's single and ready to mingle ready to go yeah i enjoy most things in nature from wandering in the eight capes at mount saint helens to walking on the beach at sunset okay and i guess that intrigued her (laughs) also low-key dry those other messages must have sucked (laughs) <laughs> probably um 
On January 30th, 1988, she spoke to Mike on the phone for the first time, and it it went well to say the least. Okay. They actually spent she she says that she thinks they spent over a hundred hours on the phone prior to like meeting in person. Oh my gosh! Wow! I'm like, damn, that's fucking, and that was probably expensive back then. <laughs> oh, that's true. No I'm unlimited like, minutes. <laughs> facts. For the first date in February 1988, they met at the Crystal Springs Road de Ro- I can't say that. Sounds at a garden. Great. At a garden. Oh, okay. Next to Reed College. <laughs> okay, that kind of sounds nice. Also, if you didn't catch that, that was a month after talk, like a month later after they had like first talked on the phone. Oh, I did not. A hundred hours in less than a month. Yeah. Holy shit, dude. I don't know how. Where Where did you find the time? I know. I'm like, aren't you in the healthcare field? Like, yeah. <laughs> when did that work? She's actually an emergency room nurse. Yeah, I feel like they have insane hours. She's probably getting no sleep. Or actually, she might have not. Well, no, she was. <laughs> um, just no sleep. <laughs> but yeah, she just they just fed the ducks and Mike. But also, like, through peanuts to squirrels. <laughs> that actually sounds fun. <laughs> <laughs> just throwing peanuts. And mostly the duck part. The peanuts just kind of sounds Have fucking my funny. nuts. Okay, you've ruined it, Brandy. Thank you for that. <laughs> You're welcome. All right. Within the year, they drove to Reno to get married. Whoa, that's yeah, fast. Like, literally that same year. Jesus. By the end of the year, they got they were married already. Oh, my gosh. She says not long after getting married, it soured. That's how it goes with abusive relationships, which I'm assuming this is one. Yep. He slowly revealed to her that he'd never been happy and basically had a super negative mindset. For like he actually like had mental issues and just was pretty depressed. He was mm-hmm. also overweight and like well, I'll get to that. But she says yeah. that his life philo- philosophy was like, this was literally something he would say all the time is, life is a sit- shit sandwich, and every day you take another bite until you die. What a cool guy. <laughs> I mean, like, same, but like... <laughs> Honestly, earlier today, because I cleaned up our living room a little bit yesterday, and then today was messy, and I was like, I told Robert, I was like, I feel like every day is just making messes and cleaning them up over and over again, and then you die. <laughs> That's kind of how it is. That's how it that's is. How it be. But I try not to think about it. <laughs> well, yeah, you try not to be like negative like that. Like this dude. What's his name again? Mike. Mike. Oh, Mike Wood. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking Mike. <laughs> um, but yeah, apparently he was a really lazy boy. Um, <laughs> he he did work, but it I think he worked at a, at a janitor at a entertainment store. Okay. Does that mean like a sex toy store? Yeah, like a... My pause there. (laughs) (laughs) That's... An adult store. What stuff was he cleaning up? I don't want it in... Nah, don't... don't Yikes. Anyways, uh, I guess he just kind of like smoked. And he drank a lot of Diet Cokes. Um, (laughs) And he would uh, like hound Susan for going out. Like with her friends or coworkers and stuff like that. He would literally like give her shit. And then he, like, monitored her spending and, like, complained about every little purchase that she would make. That's so weird and controlling. Yeah. And I read that, like, toward they were married for 17 years. Wow. Before she finally had enough. But I read that she said that she would try to kiss him and he would burp in her face. Ew. Gross. Like, that's, like... I feel like that's so disrespectful. Like, he would do it, it on is. purpose. Yeah, I'm sure there's some people where they're like, oh, that's funny, but it sounds like it clearly in their relationship was not playful. It was just him being, being an asshole. Yeah, being an asshole. But yeah, she put up with it for 17 years because she said, like, that she loved him, but, like, she couldn't take it anymore. Yeah. And she just wanted to be happy. So in September 2005, she kicked him out of the house. Um, but they, they, it kind of wasn't, there wasn't no, like, maliciousness or nothing like that. Like, she didn't, 
it didn't it never got physical it was just more mental yeah. and, and she like, wasn't like rude to him she just kind of ended it yeah like to exactly like that like they were actually just separated when everything happened they hadn't divorced oh. yet wow but yeah she wasn't like cold to him like she still loved him of course and she probably still wanted to be friends with him maybe yeah like because she still cared about him like she never changed the locks on the house or anything like that or, like the alarm clo- code yeah like, she just wanted him out you know makes me feel bad that she was so like trusting of him even after ending things yeah true but yeah so now to the little bit of, well right before the action yeah let's get excited <laughs> On the evening of Wednesday, September 6, 2006, Susan ended her shift at the Providence Portland Medical Center and headed to the Perfect Look Hair Salon. It's a cute name. <laughs> <laughs> she was now 51 years old and worked in an, an emergency room at the medical center. Oh, okay. One hour later, now rested and relaxed, she headed home. In the mud room at the back of her house, Susan found a note on the microwave, and it read, Sue, haven't been sleeping, had to get away, went to the beach, love, me. Hmm. So, so she, sorry, oh. uh, you want to go first? I had a question, but I could wait. Mm, just ask. Was he still living there? No, but she... She had asked him to, like, stop by and, like, feed her cats and stuff like that. Oh, gotcha. Just kind of, like, like, do maintenance. And he yeah. said he couldn't, but it looks like he stopped by and... Did something. Did something. <laughs> I was curious. I was like, did he, like, live in the backyard? Why did he come and leave a note? <laughs> no. Okay, cool. But, yeah, she unlocked the door and disarmed the alarm and walked through the house to the front door where she walked outside um so i guess it's houses over there like have like that entryway have you mm-hmm. heard of those like the mud, mud rooms where it's yeah just to like leave your shit in? yeah yeah but she had one of those and i guess it was common for like to enter to there but that's okay. like the back of the house or the side of the house i'm not sure yeah that part's kind of weird i thought they were like oh well, i guess they wouldn't be in the front that's just a foyer <laughs> yeah but she, like, walked outside through the front door. Okay. Um, And she remembers the time exactly because she just kind of took it all in. It was 6.37 p.m. Whoa. And, um, she just remembers it was a clear and warm day because, like, she remembers because she, like, checked the time. Yeah. And she literally, like, just stood out there for a few, like, minutes, like, just enjoying the sun, basically. Uh-huh. Like, for the scenery. But, yeah, she finally headed back inside while flipping through her mail. Once inside, she kept, kicked off her shoes and noticed how dark her bedroom was. Uh. This was unusual unusual because it was part of her routine to open them in the morning to let the sun shine in. But then she just kind of, like, dismissed it because she was like, oh, maybe, like, Mike closed it when he came by. Mm-hmm. Um... Suddenly, from behind the bedroom door, a man appeared and lurched towards her. Oh my god. Picture this. A 59... Uh, no, not a 59. <laughs> well, actually, he is 59. But a, a five foot nine, 59 year old, weighing 190 pounds, wearing a blue striped shirt and a tan baseball bat pulled down low over his eyes, long <sighs> blondish hair in a ponytail, Wearing yellow rubber gloves, like the kitchen ones. Oh my gosh. And launching towards her with a red and black claw hammer. Fuck. For some reason, the kitchen gloves is extra dark. Yeah, I'm like, what the fuck, bro? Oh my god. Like, he knew he was going to make a mess. What? Mm. We later discovered that this man was Ed Haffey, a hitman, hired by her ex-husband. Oh my gosh. Her story of survival remains one of the more shocking and violent tales of the annals of Portland crime, and one of the most heroic. Heroic? Heroic. Heroic. (laughs) You're like, (laughs) horror. Most people that see an intruder would run, but not Susan. Susan wasn't like most people. This woman had been in the emergency room 
nurse for 30 years. She had disarmed injured men, administered IVs in patients thrashing from drug withdrawals, and lastly, regularly trained in self-defense along with other nurses. Like, I guess the <gasps> hospital she worked at, like, actually, like, made them do that training. That's good. Everyone yeah. should do that. Yeah, it's good. It's it's funny because she talks, or not funny, but she, like, talks about it and she's like, I never thought, like, I would have to use these skills. Of course. No like, one thinks stuff's going to happen until it happens. True. So, quick thinking Susan saw him coming towards her and tried to, like, basically get as close to him as she can because she knows that his swings, like, won't, like, it would be less force if she the closer she is to him. Yeah, you can't really swing up close. Yeah. But um he managed to hit her on her left temple. Oh my and god. And he, he did get a few blows in before like she was able to get super close to him. Oh my god. But yeah, she obviously screamed and was like, Who are you? What do you want? Like what the fuck? She was just screaming, you know, like Yeah. Obviously she doesn't know what the fuck's going on. But he didn't stop nor answer. I can't believe oh. she went towards him. Right? I would have. I, I wouldn't, and I probably would be dead. <laughs> <laughs> Facts. So she tried to use her weight against him by slamming her body against his to like try to like knock him over. Okay. Yeah, she was heavier, you said, right? Yeah. But okay. but she was shorter. He's he was five foot seven and she was Five foot four. Oh no, she's tiny. Yeah, but yeah, she was tiny compared to him. He was almost six foot. Yikes. But yeah, she failed and he ended up pushing her back into the wall and then uttered his only words that night, which were, You're strong. Oh, creepy. <sighs> yeah. And she says, like, when she's retelling the story, she says that, like, this was the moment that she knew, like, oh fuck like he's here to kill me like yeah he's not here to mess around like it's i gotta fight and that statement too just sounds like he's done it before like making you know like oh usually people aren't mm. or maybe, he just, like, maybe he just expected it to be easy i don't know oh, so creepy but she pushed him again and demanded to know who sent him she they were basically like fighting this whole time wrestling and she managed to get the hammer from him and swung its claw, like, a few times into his skull. <gasps> oh, my yeah. God. The claw? Um, the claw. Well, it's Whenever he... Do you Sorry. know those hammers? It's the ones with, like, it has, like, the the back part. It's so you can, um like, pull up nails. Yeah, we have one of those. Yeah, I guess they're called claw hammers. I didn't know that. Oh, my God. What side did he hit her with? The, like, actual hammer part. Okay. I mean, both are fucking terrifying. I, like <laughs> I don't even know why I asked. The part would hurt more, though. Or just, oh. like, fuck. This is awful. <laughs> yeah. Anyways, he ended up snatching the hammer back. And so she, like, inst instinctively, like, grabbed his throat. And was oh. basically choking him and was like, who sent you? Um, oh, my God. And the intruder's face turned red, then purple, and then a darker purple with a blue tinge, which spooked Susan, so she let go and tried to flee. But he got up right away and, like, caught up to her and spun her around and just basically started going ham on her face. <gasps> with a uh, hammer or his hands? No, his hands. Okay, so, I mean, still awful. But <laughs> yeah, he just punched her in the face and um, split her lip open. Ugh. And then just kept hitting her until she, like, it caused her to fall on the floor. Fuck. Meanwhile, there, this all happened still in her bedroom. Oh my gosh, they're still in the same room? Yeah. I imagine this was, like, all over the house. <laughs> no, it's still in the bedroom. Okay. Um, so he stood over her with the hammer, and she was basically thinking, like, fuck, like, this is it? Like, I'm gonna die here today? And so basically oh. her, her mentality was, like... If I am gonna die, I'm gonna make sure like that they tie him to it. Yeah. So, yeah, she says to this day she's not sure how she met how, but she managed to pull the man to the floor. Um, Dang. 
She got that like super strength going on. Oh yeah. So basically, she just started to bite him. She mm -hmm. ended up biting like his arm, his thigh, and his uh, you know what? Oh my god, really? Yeah, through the zipper, bro. She was going Damn. ham. And basically, the whole time she was like biting him and like basically trying to like you know Mark him. Not, not murder him. Uh, yeah. She was like frantically just trying to rifle through his pockets, trying to find anything to like toss under her bread, bread, her <laughs> bed, or like the bookshelf in her room, like just oh, like, like personal belongings. Yeah, and, that, and that's smart. why she she is smart, and that's why she was trying to bite him too to like leave her bite marks on him. Yeah. Oh my gosh, I didn't even think about that. I was like scratching her pull his hair like for DNA. Bite marks is like great because that yeah. leaves marks. Yeah, and then also, like, what the thing she said, she was like, I was thinking to maybe hope to find, like, an ID or something and toss it under oh the Oh, my bed. God. I'm surprised she could think of all this, like, spur of the moment when this is happening. Well, I feel like when you're a nurse, you have to be quick thinking. That's true. She's, like, she's seen some shit. Yeah. <laughs> 30 years in the emergency room, she's seen some shit. Yeah, she's ready to go. She runs at the man with the hammer. Yeah, like, my, my cousin... She's she works in the emergency room and she's yeah. only been working there I think maybe one or two years and she's seen a lot of shit already. Dang. So times thirty. <laughs> oh my god. No, yeah, I'm sure she's seen a lot. <laughs> so the fight had now lasted about fourteen minutes. They were oh, both. What? Yeah. Oh my god. So they were both like in the hallway, wedged on their sides. Mm-hmm. Um, they were just outside like Susan's bedroom in the hallway. So she ended up throwing her left leg over Ed's body and climbed on top of him and hooked her left arm around his neck. So he was I can't really like I wish I could show you, but basically he was like, on his stomach. Okay. And she got out like on top of him and like hooked oh. her arm under. Him. I was and imagining more of a spooning position, but she was just on top of him. Yeah. Okay. And she was, like, yelling at him, and she's like, tell me who sent you here, and I will call you a fucking ambulance. Oh my god, Susan! Right? What are you doing? Susan is a badass. Uh, she's the real assassin here. <laughs> she's fucking coming for you. She's saving herself, okay? Yeah, in, we like, the most hardcore way. We appreciate strong women. We do. We appreciate you, Susan. So, <laughs> he said nothing and just growled. She... <laughs> She leaned forward, tightening her forearm against his throat until he stopped moving. Oh, my God. Oh, yeah. Well, well, it's because basically when she was, like, yelling at him to tell tell me who sent you here. Um, yeah. She, like, kind of, like, loosened her grip. and So, like, let him answer. Yeah, but then he, like, took that opportunity to try to escape. So then she tightened it again until he stopped moving. And um, then she just grabbed the hammer and fled outside to her neighbors. Holy shit. Yeah. Good thing her neighbor was home. I know. Scary. Whew. So Ed Haffey, the hitman, turned out to be uh, a Vietnam veteran who turned out to have a very long rap sheet. Yeah. A veteran turned, what is it, like assassin basically? <laughs> Yeah, hitman. Hitman, that's it. <laughs> Assassin sounds too serious. Too hardcore, but guess yeah. what? Guess what? What? It turns out 15 years earlier, Ed had arranged the murder of his ex-girlfriend, 39-year-old Georgia Lee Dutton. Wait, <laughs> what? Yeah, so he became the hitman after he had ordered a hitman 15 years earlier. Oh, did it work last time he hired somebody? Yeah. Oh my god, it actually carried out? I was like... Yeah, his ex-girlfriend, like, that, she actually was murdered and... Holy he shit. Pled, he pled guilty and spent nine years in, in prison. And decided to become a hitman himself? Well, I don't think it was like that. It was more <laughs> of an opportunity. And I, fi I personally think he agreed to it, not just for the $50,000. Wow, that's a lot of money. But because... um. I feel like because he arranged for his girlfriend, like he understood 
Where he's like, hey, I like, hate women too. Yeah, like he understood <laughs> what it felt like to want to get rid of a woman. Oh my god. Which so he like, he'd never uh, been a hitman before. It was just no. for her. Okay. Yeah. Um, it turns out that Ed and Mike were co-workers at the entertainment place. Ew. And they just kind of met up and talked about it a few times, and Ed agreed to it. We'll oh get more. God. We'll get more into that. Yeah, this is a lot to take in right now. <laughs> so in Susan's home. After everything went down, she went back the next day with her neighbor to mm -hmm. get, like, a few of her belongings. Um, and that's when one of her neighbor actually, like, went down to the basement. I'm not sure why, but... I think her neighbor's just, like, really nosy. Maybe. But <laughs> they actually found a backpack that belonged to Ed. Mm -hmm. And inside, it contained a container of Hershey's syrup, $200 cash, diabetes pills... A day book and a pay stub made out to Ed. So the usual stuff you bring when you're about to murder someone. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> so fucking weird. But yeah, as soon as this happened, obviously they're going to look at Mike. But yeah. Mike, oh, never mind. Uh, Even if he wasn't that. guilty. Yeah. But an entry in his day book that they found um, for Monday, September 4th, 2006 was marked Call Mike. And a man manila folder with mm -hmm. Mike's cell phone number in on it. This guy really thought he was going to get away with it. He was bringing mm -hmm. all this compromising information. Right, he really did. Now that you told me he'd never done this before, I'm extra like, dude, what? <laughs> it's, yeah. So and why bring a hammer? Well, that was just his weapon of choice. Well, he was, he was like, uh, I don't think he had like had a place to live. Oh, struggling. okay. Yeah. So he did it for the money. Jesus. Um, Ed's aut aut autopsy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so Ed died. Yes, Ed died. I feel like I didn't notice that. Well, I guess this entire story's been shocking. Maybe I just <laughs> didn't even realize. <laughs> yeah, she, she, she killed him. Holy oh, shit. Died. Dang, Susan has more kill count than he does. Dang. <laughs> So his autopsy would show that he had a near lethal dose of cocaine in the system. God, that probably explains why the fight was going on for so long. Yeah, I think he like got high right before she got home. Oh yeah. So basically Mike knew that they were looking for him. And so on September eighth, two thousand six, Mike left a suicide note on his at his father's house. Whoa. Um, it read, all I ever wanted was to be loved, and every time I had it, I fucked it up. He then <laughs> bolted <laughs> and basically disappeared. Mm -hmm. So five five days later, on September 13th, they caught him in the parking lot garage of a, like a mental, mental institution. Mm -hmm. And he was claiming to check himself in, or like, like that he was going to. Yeah. But they, like, arrested him before he could. What the fuck? Well, they arrested him, but then they did, like, su su not submit. What's the word? Admit. Admit. They're like, you do need help, though. Yeah. <laughs> like, he basically told them, he's like, I have nothing to live for anymore. Yeah, he wrote a suicide note, and five days later, he was still alive. That's kind of weird. Yeah. Now I'm just going to read you a little, like, part, or transcript. Okay. Mike, am I under arrest? Detective, at this point you are, so what I'd like to do is re-advise you of your Miranda rights. You're not going to believe my side of the story. Why is that? We haven't heard your side of the story. My side of the story is so fucking off the wall. <laughs> and he never really says his story. Also, how off the wall could it be compared to, like, Susan's story? <laughs> <laughs> There's, there's literally no way uh, that would have been hilarious his story's even crazier <laughs> facts yeah so it turns out that he had lost his job was homeless and was angry oh wow what a crazy story not easy that's nothing but basically what they think was the motivator was like he was homeless and broke and angry 
And I think he was motivated to kill Susan because the house that she was living in was, like, technically their house. And mm-hmm. it was paid off. So uh... his thinking was, like, let me get rid of her and the house will be mine. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Usually they do it for life insurance, but she had actually changed the beneficiary to her brother. And he knew that, so that Shit. killing her for the house was, like, the next be- best option, I guess. Damn. So, Mike denied it, um, but security records showed that someone had disabled the alarm while Susan was at work. So oh. Ba- yeah, basically, they were like, obviously, you, you probably went there and let in Ed. And he was like, no, I didn't. It wasn't me. Okay, then who else would turn off the alarm? Yeah, right? <laughs> Uh, so, a former cellmate of Ed actually came forward saying that Ed had asked him to join a burglary. Bur- <laughs> no way! Burglary? <laughs> oh my god, bring it back. A robbery! <laughs> <laughs> he called it an insurance scam. Oh. He and Ed had met with Mike, who told him he'd pay him 5000 if he helped Ed kill his wife. But the guy <laughs> the guy said no. Yeah, that's not enough money. <laughs> yeah, definitely not. Also, uh-huh. he didn't even like report it or anything before. He's like, eh, you yeah. guys do your thing. <laughs> On November 17th, another witness told police he'd driven Ed to meet a bald man in the parking <laughs> lot. Days after, he saw the man's picture in the news after Susan's attack. He identified that man as Mike. Who? So I mean, I you you keep denying it, sir. I don't like, know. Sounds like it was him. <laughs> it sounds yeah. And he went on the run after it happened and wrote a suicide note. Mm-hmm. He's a little suspect. Sketch. On August thirtieth, two thousand seven, Mike pled guilty and was sentenced to ten years in jail. That's not a long time. It's not. But you, you gotta remember again, he was like in his fifties. True, and I guess he didn't actually do it, so it's not as long. true. And I actually wanted to share this little, like, letter that Susan got. Okay. Because it's kind of like, aw. Um, (laughs) She got it from Ed's aunt. Oh, okay. And it read, Although this was a terrible thing that happened, no one in this family has any bad feelings towards you. You did what you were forced to do, And in doing so, you spared many from the same trauma you experienced. Wow. I was like, damn. That's really intense for them to send that. I thought they just wouldn't have said anything, honestly. Yeah. Fuck. Um, But yeah, it was just really, I felt really bad for Susan afterwards, because obviously. That's traumatizing. Yeah, she had to kill somebody. super, like, traumatizing. And she was actually, like, super paranoid. Oh, I bet. She said she felt like a broken plate glued back together. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, and she also said that... I think it was... It was close. Well, uh, Like, after eight years, they were talking about how he was supposed to be released soon. Ooh. And, like, they, like, had an interview with her, and she was like, I feel like I'm doing a life sentence for picking a bad husband. Yeah, and it's not her of, fault. Like, yeah, like, the after effect of it all. That's sad. Yeah. On Friday, June 13th, 2014, Mike died of cancer 92 days before he was supposed to be released. Honestly, thank God. I was going to say, what happens when he gets out? (laughs) No, yeah, and that's what they were talking to her about, like, the two years prior. Like, they were basically interviewing about how she felt, and she was like, I'm scared. And she had, like, done so many things. Like, she got a restraining order against him. Basically, she's like, I'm Oh, and also, while he was in jail... Um, she sued him for, what do you call it? Like emotional distress or something. Oh, good. A million dollars. And she actually won. And she was like, I don't even care about the money. It's just more like she doesn't want him to like have money to be able to like hire another hitman when he. Yeah. Uh, She's probably never got any money because he was broke. But yeah, don't give him any opportunities. (laughs) Yeah, basically. And she like got a restraining order and was like. You know, don't want him in my town, basically. Holy shit. But yeah, she still cries while retelling her story, but she says it's good for her. 
because Aww. she says, when I cry, I feel better. Oh my gosh, Susan. Yeah. That's so, so scary. Today, she now goes by Susan Walters. And she is a motivational speaker. She provides self-defense expertise and <laughs> has become a go-to expert on victim rights. Oh my gosh. She is pretty fucking cool, huh? Yeah. <laughs> she is now 65 years old and still a badass, if you ask me. <laughs> Dang. I can't believe she, like, ran at that guy still. Well, that will be forever shocking. Ballsy. So ballsy. I would never think to do that. She's a smart lady. See, I thought my story was crazy. And... I don't know. Yours turn into a hitman becoming the hit. That was just <laughs> shocking. <laughs> also, like, I don't understand why he wanted to, why the husband, Mike, wanted to kill Susan. Because he was like, oh, I'm poor, all this stuff. I lost my job. Let me spend whatever money I still have murdering my wife? What's the logic there? Well, I mean, I think he did have money, but it was the fact that he lost his job and wasn't going to have money and then also like I think he just had a falling out with his dad so his dad like kicked him out yeah I and I mean no reason to kill her though Jesus yeah I don't know <laughs> that was a good story thank you Brandy <laughs> you're welcome if you guys would like to email us you can at the spooky shit dot pod at gmail dot com our instagram and twitter are spooky shit underscore pod and our website is spooky shit dash pod dot com you could check out our merch if you guys want to leave us any reviews. That'd be great on like Apple Podcast or whatever you use. And thank you for listening. You have anything else to add, Brandel? No. Okay. All right. Goodbye. Bye.